It covers a third of the world's surface. Ringed by fire. Constantly reshaped by the almighty clash of Earth's tectonic plates. Creating life forms that in turn become the architects of underwater empires. Here, the world's most primitive life forms have outlived dinosaurs and found astonishing ways to adapt and survive in one of the most competitive environments on the planet. This is the wildest Pacific. The Pacific Ocean spans 15 and a half thousand kilometers of latitude from north to south across vastly varying temperatures and topography. With such far-reaching unseen boundaries, it's little wonder the 25,000 islands within the Pacific Ocean look so vastly different from each one to the next. From New Guinea, the world's largest island in the heart of the Coral Triangle. To sand caves barely meters across, sitting atop reef crests. Across the Pacific, long chains of atolls support life on the remnants of ancient volcanoes. In its eastern fringes lie islands that are little more than rocky exposed peaks. The tips of underwater mountains so enormous they rival the world's tallest mountains on land. These summits of sand and stone scarcely hint at the incredible living networks that exist below the waterline. After a short warm-up, he takes a deep breath. chain that constantly feeds upward and nourishes the land and the air breathing life above. This ocean scale is difficult to comprehend. The Pacific's basin is greater than the landmass of all the world's continents combined. It spans more than 155 million square kilometers. The long stretches of open water between landfall appear to offer scant opportunity to feed, rest, and survive. And yet still they do. Many organisms, like jellyfish, live out their entire existence without ever coming into contact with land, the sea floor, or the surface. Large seabirds with great wingspans, such as albatross and frigates, can spend days, even months, at sea before returning to land. Oceanic fish species, like the four-meter-long sunfish, include some of the biggest and fastest beings in the water. These are pelagic species. Pelagics usually have a darker-colored upper body to avoid being spotted from air, and a lighter underbelly that blends with a sunlit surface when seen from below. Many are migrators undertaking trans-Pacific journeys in constant search of places to feed, mate, and birth new generations. Dwarfing their reef counterparts, giant oceanic manta rays reach astounding disk spans nearly nine meters across. They can dive to a thousand meters, but tend to feed on surface plankton. And that's what compels them to travel exceptionally long distances. Giant manta rays will migrate some 12,000 kilometers across the Pacific to stopover points. They follow the oceanic currents to coasts and islands with seasonal conditions ripe for planktonic blooms. So too, 
to whale sharks. This is the planet's largest living fish. They can grow as large as 18 meters long and weigh in at 20 to 30 tons. Whale sharks have an intimidating mouth size, but it's one that is purely designed for a mass ingestion of plankton. With its cartilage skeleton, it is a shark, but this is a filter feeder, and they need enormous amounts of tiny plankton to fuel their large bodies. Little is known about whale shark migration paths, except they are incredibly long. One such path stretches from the Central Americas deep into the Pacific. One female whale shark has been recorded logging more than 20,000 kilometers in under a year. Extraordinarily, considering it's the world's largest fish and can live for a hundred years, where they go for several months at a time remains a mystery. Indo-Pacific sailfish roam the ocean across latitudes, heading south for summers and toward the equator each autumn. On the South and Central American West Coasts, they're chasing these, sardines. The sardines, too, are following a feeding route. Plankton flourishes in the colder currents. When sardines school tightly in a ball like this, it's not for feeding. It's because they're under attack. Sailfish hunt in groups. Much like dolphins and some whales, they have learned to herd sardines toward the water surface into tight schools called bait balls. The sailfish separate out a group and surround it. In strong hunting grounds, scores of sailfish can work a few tiny bait balls at a time. They plunge into the sardine school from all directions until they're forced to pack together densely. With nowhere to go either side, the sardines head further up into the water column. Sailfish rely on speed sprints. They have large hearts and gill surface areas for their body size, so they can extract more oxygen from the water. These are nature's machines built for racing. But sardines are also fast, and their smaller size means they have better maneuverability. For the sailfish, their secret weapon in this hunt isn't speed, it's their bills. They're dagger sharp and 30 centimeters long. The sailfish thrusts the bill into the center of a bait ball and with a quick head shake, strikes a sardine out of the school and swallows the fish whole. The sails work the bait ball closer and closer to the surface. Over hours, they hit the small fish. The sardines are tired and most are wounded from bill strikes. When they reach the surface, there's nowhere else to go. And that's when a second attack launches. This time, from above. The sailfish now have competition. Great frigate birds are incredible oceanic endurance hunters. They can stay at sea for two months at a time without touching land. However, frigates don't have great waterproofing on their feathers. Rather than spending time sitting on the surface and fishing, they wait until other predators herd the fish upward. And then, 
Frigates will spend hours tracking bait schools, simply waiting for the sardines to reach striking distance from the air. Under attack from above and below, the bait balls scatter and regroup, circling tighter and tighter, looking for any path for escape. Finally, it opens up. A small hole in the wall of bills and a slim chance for the school to charge through. They take the risk. And it works. They plunge as deeply and as quickly as they can. But more than a dozen sailfish sprint behind them in relentless pursuit to the depths below. This is a gorgeous mangrove snake. Oh, threatening me there and striking as well. They have a reputation for being a little aggressive. Oh, look at that. Ah, oh, oh, he's got a good grip. Where open ocean nears coastlines, species diversity increases. Mouth mackerel are found out wide in warmer waters, but close to shores with planktonic blooms. These fish have found a way to maximize their plankton intake. They swim with their wide mouths and large gill rakers open, effectively straining the small larvae and eggs from the salt water. Loggerhead turtles return to Pacific feeding grounds after heading east and north for the nesting season. They undertake long journeys of up to 12,000 kilometers. As loggerheads near land, clashes over rights to feeding territories can be fierce. These ancient reptiles eat jellyfish, crustaceans, and algae and can weigh around 150 kilograms. For most open ocean travelers, the chance to rest and feed comes at small points of refuge in this vast oceanic desert. Pacific atolls. A classic atoll is a ring-shaped reef that encircles a shallow lagoon, often with a small island in the center. An atoll begins its formation as an underwater volcano called a seamount. As the volcano erupts, lava builds, hardens, and increases the underwater mountain in height. It eventually breaks the ocean's surface, forming an island. Coral polyps colonize the walls below sea level and fan out to form a fringing reef system from the island. Over millions of years, the dormant volcano erodes and sinks, leaving an atoll reef behind. Within many of these rings of reef, sand accumulates and forms an island once more, which is then propagated by seabirds. The atoll is complete. Atolls litter the Pacific, providing a safe haven for both oceanic nomads and resident coral reef communities. The surf zone is where waves created by winds traveling long oceanic distances finally collide into the atoll outer walls. Hardy surgeon fish are unfazed by the buffeting energy. They're aided by thin streamlined bodies, engineered to navigate a perpetually dynamic environment. A common reef fish there are more than 70 species of surgeons worldwide. They vary dramatically in color, but all have these distinctive tails. Tipped with a set of razor-sharp spines each side, these scalpels earn them their surgeon fish qualification. However, their most important role is that of resident gardener. 
the sunlit, oxygenated lagoons around atolls create prime conditions for growing algae. It's resilient, fast-growing, and competes with coral for space. Keeping it in check is essential to the health of a reef. The surgeon fish is a herbivore that prefers algae. Large schools of these grazers, like striped convicts and white-spotted surgeons, are a healthy indication the lagoon ecosystem is well balanced. Parrotfish are also designed to negotiate surf zones, with strong pectoral fins that beat much like the wings of the birds they're named for. These are one of the many reef species that change gender throughout their lives. To keep a male-female ratio balance, the parrotfish can completely change their physiology to create male or female gametes. They then reproduce communally via broadcast spawning. Small groups of males and females rise up to the midwater column above the reef, but below the waves, out of reach of both surface and seabed predators. The parrotfish twist and turn in a tight ball, releasing eggs and sperm. For the best chance of the gametes meeting and being carried away from feeding areas, they carefully time the broadcast release on the outgoing tide. It pays to be careful. In a vast ocean sparsely littered with structure, these atoll walls are thick with predators. Bluefin trevally hunt solo or in small packs. It gives them enough confidence to tailgate an apex predator, the grey reef shark. In this way, they can take advantage of any stray scraps in the event of a shark strike. The trevally may even risk using the reef shark for a quick clean by rubbing up against the shark's rough skin to slough away parasites. These reef sharks favor deep grottos and canyons on the seaward side of an atoll. Although most active at night, even by day, the gray reef shark is on high alert. It constantly scans its surrounds via a highly advanced sensory system. It hears by picking up vibrations using sensory pits called the lateral line. It smells minute traces of blood in the water by sweeping its head side to side to engage both nostrils. And its vision is so specialized it can hunt by starlight. Sharks with poor eyesight, like this lemon shark, rely more heavily on an additional sense, electroreception. Jelly-filled tubes open to tiny pores on their snout. These allow them to detect electrical currents. Salt water carries these currents from other animals' muscle twitches and movement in a way air does not. The lemon shark slowly cruises an inner atoll channel waiting to pick up the faintest pulse of prey in hiding. Inside the lagoon walls, weaker swimmers are protected from the rolling surf. Schools of fish congregate to feed on the smaller crustaceans and larvae that flourish in the calmer waters. Sea snakes are strong oceanic swimmers, but come into lagoons to hunt. They have small, flattened heads to minimize water resistance and paddle like tails. True members of this family, like the olive sea snake, live out their entire lives in the water. Sea crates are also marine reptiles. 
birds spend some of their time on land, returning to digest prey, drink fresh water and reproduce. The banded sea crate has enormous lungs, large enough to allow them to stay underwater for more than 30 minutes. Like many land snakes, it's also armed with a deadly venom. A sea crate's venom is 10 times stronger than that of a cobra or rattlesnake. Often hunting in pairs or even a pack, these reptiles investigate every lagoon crevice. It's one of the few animals that can send a much larger moray eel deep into hiding. Sea crates will stalk and eat eels more than twice their own size. The crate's venom is powerful enough to paralyze it and swallow it whole. This eel remains undetected today. The sea crates move on. Came right up to the camera, grabbed a hold of it. I started pulling back, kept kept grabbing it, wouldn't let it go, and ripped it right off the pole. Son of a bitch. Emperors, snapper, and trumpet fish forage in the fading light, eager to boost energy stores before nightfall. Remote lagoons foster their own set of social norms amongst the schooling fish. With such high and varied populations all competing for space, a feeding hierarchy is created to allow a number of species to coexist. However, they'll all make way for the top tier residents. Sundown cues the arrival of gray and black tip reef sharks. Black tips are smaller sharks of about two and a half meters, but like most reef sharks, they tend to hunt in packs. In outer Pacific lagoons, they rarely travel beyond a range of a couple of square kilometers. The sharks find crevices and currents to rest in by day and come out to feed at night. The resident pack builds in numbers as gray reef sharks join them to hunt alongside. The sharks re-establish their territory and make it clear they are the dominant species. A fusilier school is scattered in different directions as they sprint to give way to the night visitors. But there is one lagoon predator approaching from the distance that trumps them all. It's a tiger shark. Tiger sharks are consummate predators. In open ocean, tiger sharks can reach the size and weight of a large car, one and a half tons in all. Lagoons are usually stalked by juvenile tigers, where they're safer from cannibalistic adults. But here, even a small tiger is still the largest predator in the water. Named for the distinctive stripes across its massive girth, this tiger won't hesitate to take on a black tip reef shark. It doesn't feel the need to eat yet, but still exerts its dominance at the top of the lagoon food chain. The black tip pack thins out around the tiger's path. Near the atoll wall, one courting pair is oblivious to the nearby danger. Titan triggerfish are a large reef fish. They can grow to three quarters of a meter long. Titans have strong mouths and sharp teeth 
for grinding into coral to forage for small worms and mollusks. Normally solitary, in the mating season, males move to traditional nesting grounds. They set up in the same area year after year, generation after generation. Here, they'll be visited by a female. The triggerfish pair decide if they'll be parents together, based on how well they dance. The fish circle one another in a mating ritual. Their focus is solely on each other for the duration of the courtship. For an hour or two, the enclosing sharks are ignored, relegated from the role of predators to that of audience members. The dance will come to a close when the sun is well below the horizon, before the lagoon night hunters begin to feed. The Pacific is so vast, as one day ends in a western atoll, another dawns on an eastern island. Although atolls can exist for centuries, their shallow caves and lagoons yield easily to the rise and fall of the sea. Islands, in contrast, stick around much longer. Oceanic islands are formed in the same way as atolls, but remain stable rather than collapsing. Seamounts rise hundreds or even thousands of feet from the floor, but are yet to reach the water surface. Islands have breached the surface to a point where land exists beyond the reach of high tide. Oceanic islands have never had connections to continents. One such island is Malpelo. From the air, it presents as little more than a barren, rocky outcrop populated by a seabird colony. But below the waterline, this massive volcanic mountain is the epicenter of a vast, very complex and extremely busy underwater metropolis. Malpelo Island is a part of Colombia. It sits about 500 kilometers from its coast. It's the corner of a triangle that includes the Cocos and Galapagos Islands, where major ocean currents and countercurrents converge. Here, in the far eastern fringes of the Pacific, unique biological behaviors have evolved. Interspecies relationships occur, rarely seen elsewhere in the Pacific. Like far-flung villages with little contact, the rules and laws of nature are very different on these isolated oceanic islands. Beyond the immediate reach of continental land pollution, garden beds of lush and vivid soft corals flourish. The very cold Humboldt current comes in from the south and collides with the equatorial countercurrent, both bringing bounties of nutrient-rich water. Thermoclines occur where the warm surface water mixes with the cooler deep water from below. In this layer, vision is distorted. Animals like butterfly fish appear to shimmer and buckle where the pockets of mixed temperatures collide. The Malpelo residents aren't impervious to the temperature changes. While this leather bass forages alongside a moray eel, a thermocline passes by. Most fish are ectotherms, which means they are cold-blooded. Their body temperature changes with the environment around them. And here, it's in a constant state of fluctuation. The base of Malpelo is some 300 meters below sea level and plunges to more than four kilometers below at a nearby drop-off. However, there are many vast steps along the island flanks. Sunlight can still reach the upper ledges at 30 to 40 meters. Here, large volcanic boulders are thick with algae and sponges. Hawksbill turtles are voracious consumers of both. 
eating 500 kilograms of sponge alone each year. Their beak mouths are designed to mow into algae, which helps keep it from reaching levels that would smother the coral. More often residents than passers-by, this hawksbill becomes a mobile serving plate for a school of angelfish. Angelfish are herbivores. Today, grazing on the algae on offer straight from the hawksbill shell. These turtles can live for 50 years. Though it continuously grows out new layers of shell, this one is likely to have built up a substantial algal coat over many years. Along the boulders, large schools of these angelfish forage side by side with leather bass. Leather bass are notorious for capitalizing on the hard work of other species. They prefer small mollusks and crustaceans, but keep up with the grazing herbivores to scavenge any morsels they may stir up. They'll also hunt alongside another, more predatory partner, the moray eel. Morays usually take up residence in a reef bommie or crevice and simply wait for prey to pass by their entrance. They have poor eyesight, so this is a reliable method for them. But they do have an excellent sense of smell. At Malpelo Island, they come far out of their protective holes and actively stalk the boulders. and they do so in large numbers. Not content to wait for a meal to come to them, the eels work together to probe for shrimp, crabs, fish and smaller eels. Their bodies are perfectly designed for winding between the boulders. As the eel numbers increase and small creatures begin to flee, shoals of leather bass descend to join the hunt. The eels and the large fish begin a rare, cooperative hunting technique, a feeding behavior unique to these far-flung oceanic islands. The leather bass pounce on escapees and begin to flush out crevices themselves. Soon, huge schools of leather bass hover above the hunting area. Like seagulls over a bait school, they are a dead giveaway as to where the fleeing prey is trapped. It encourages more eels to move in. It's thought, perhaps in this way, the leather bass may help the poorly sighted eels pinpoint where the food is. There are only a handful of animals across the world known to hunt together this way. With strong currents swirling along the undersea mountain edges, it pays to have a good set of brakes. Pufferfish have undulating pectoral fins to propel them along, or fan out to stop. These large, bloated-looking fish are built for hovering. There are more than 120 species worldwide. At Malpelo, guinea fowl, spotted and yellow pufferfish forage together. They suspend head down over rocks to pick at mussels, clams and shellfish aided by unusual teeth. Pufferfish only have four teeth, but they're fused together into long, sharp plates. They occasionally squabble with each other, but are rarely bothered by other fish. That's because nearly every pufferfish is highly poisonous. It's believed they synthesize their deadly toxins from the bacteria in the animals they eat converting it to poison stored in their own liver and skin. Some also have spikes embedded in their scaleless skin. It's a combination that usually affords these pufferfish safe passage through boulder terrain. Along the island's walls, black-nosed butterfly fish soar out of the thermocline. 
As the light grows darker, these fish will fade in color to blend better with the dark crevices they'll hide in for the evening. They make way for a barrage of bluefin trevally coming up from the deep, heading to the surface to look for smaller fish to feed on. Rival predators already await. Streamlined and sharp-toothed, barracuda are relentless hunters. When they determine it's time to attack, they can surge after prey at sprints of 40 kilometers an hour. But until then, energy conservation is key. By schooling closely together, they draft on the fish ahead. There's less drag on the barracuda's body, and so less energy is needed to swim. In the cavernous areas of the island, big eye trevally aggregate in huge numbers. Schools of more than one and a half thousand fish move in circles right up and down the water column, forming dense clouds that span 30 meters across. It's difficult for any other species to penetrate the trevally group. When night falls, their large eyes will help them to hunt crab octopus and smaller fish. But now, with dusk approaching, they come together to keep watch. Malpelo Island is renowned for its shark aggregations. The silky shark is a cornerstone species here. In such a large expanse of open ocean, the opportunity to converge on a food chain as dense and rich as this one is simply too good to refuse. These sharks are named for their silky smooth skin, or at least by a shark's standard. The silky has such densely packed scales that its smooth skin creates a distinctive sheen in the light. They close in on a massive school of snapper. Stragglers speed up to join their group. There's safety in numbers. But these silkies simply join the school. At a relaxed pace, they can sway their snouts from side to side to sniff out any signs of sickness or weakness in the group. With thousands of silkies patrolling Malpello, Prey fish like these juvenile red snapper have been forced to adapt with highly sophisticated schooling techniques. Like all sharks, silkies are armed with electroreceptors to detect even the faintest of electrical signals emitted by living beings in the water. Around Malpello, the young Jordan snapper bunch together extremely tightly. It's less conducive to free swimming, but it's thought the densely packed bodies produce an electrical force field so large it confuses the shark. Shape making is another technique, and near this island, schooling fish take it to new levels. They effectively take on the shape and mass of a much larger creature. They get the detail extraordinarily accurate, even taking on the characteristics of a larger head and narrower tail. Moving between schools is a high-risk activity. The fish create thin, fast-moving highways, then quickly regroup again. If a predator isn't deterred by the time they come close enough to investigate, a wall of closely packed eyes is extremely off-putting. In the world's largest ocean, space may not be an issue, but grouping together in this extremely close-knit way allows the best chance of survival. Other species simply try to stay out of sight. 
blue and gold snapper hug the walls of Heaven's Gate. The name of a large sea cave at the bottom of a 30 meter drop to a ledge floor. These brightly colored fish are particularly abundant in the Pacific's far east and a targeted species for most predators here. They stay deep and close to sea caves in peak feeding times. Sea caves within the island flanks begin as a small crack or weakness in the rock walls. Tremendous force from waves and currents puts pressure on the weakness and cracks the rock from within. The areas erode over time, gouging out overhanging ledges, grottos and deep caves. Dark areas for hiding, hunting and resting. White tip reef sharks spend their days holed up under ledges and in caves, saving their energy for night hunts. Technically, sharks don't sleep. They oscillate between periods of wake and rest. Some sharks are able to do this while slowly cruising the sea floor. They have to, to keep oxygenated water flowing through their gills. White tips are equipped with spiracles or small holes to pump water through their gills while they lay immobile. Deep within Heaven's Gate, large figures emerge from the dark. With wingspans of nearly three meters, distinctive white spots and long trailing tails, spotted eagle rays are difficult to miss. These rays are extremely social. They can journey long distances of thousands of kilometers across the open ocean in small groups, traveling in formation at the same speed. However, it's recently been discovered eagle rays do tend to have home bases, and Malpelo Island appears to be one. Deep within the caves, they can corner squid and small fish. Hunting in the dark is not an issue. Like their close relatives, sharks, they have electroreceptors to detect electrical pulses. The rays also pursue each other. A male will follow a female at a safe distance until her interest is assured. At the top of their long tails are up to six venomous spines, which deliver a nasty sting if used defensively. Emerging from the sea cave, the spotted eagle ray is immediately attended to by yellow butterfly fish. These butterflies offer cleaning surfaces at Malpelo. They groom the oceanic travelers picking parasites built up over long journeys. The eagle ray eats at the same time, straight from the volcano flanks. It has a large duck-like bill designed to shovel for invertebrates. Inside their mouths, specialized jaws with plates grind the shells of mollusks and crabs. The ray then swallows the fleshy parts of the animal and spits out the shell. The spotted eagle ray's disc-like body shape makes them incredibly adept at steering and negotiating all conditions. From open ocean to narrow cave depths and along the relentless surf zone of the island peak. The summit is similar to that of a land-based mountain. This one stretches 4,000 meters from base to the tip. It just happens to largely be underwater. If it peaks below the waterline, it would be classified as a seamount. It's the jagged, 
exposed rocks jutting almost 400 meters above sea level that define Malpelo as an island. Pacific island life in the warm climes offers a stunning range of biodiversity. But on this rocky outcrop, miles from any other land, conditions are harsh. Trade winds from the northeast and southeast converge here, stripping the rock of anything but the hardiest moss, lichen and algae. Even this sparse vegetation is kept to minimal levels by the island's terrestrial crab, the Jongarthia lagostoma. However, this tiny outpost, little more than a square kilometer of landmass, supports the world's largest colony of Nazca boobies. This distinctive orange-billed species is endemic to the Pacific. As many as 50,000 live on Malpelo's summit. From the rocky peaks, the Nazcas watch for bait balls and schooling action at the water's surface. These are fishing birds, and they must hunt and return to feed their young. The perilous cliffs are not a kind terrain for such a vital rookery. Each of these chicks is already a survivor. Every breeding season, two eggs are laid, but only one chick lives beyond the first days. The hatchling to emerge first will push the second chick out of the nest when it's born. The late arrival starves or perishes on the cliffs below. Resources are scant here. The parents can only afford to tend to the older sibling. Only one NASCAR booby chick ever survives. Though schooling fish are common in deep and mid-water around islands, here, the first few meters of depth are unusually thick with huge numbers. They're drawn to this top layer by cold upwellings. Upwellings occur when strong winds consistently move the top layer of water. Colder water, rich with plankton, is drawn to the surface. The cold currents bring another, much larger fish. A hammerhead shark. Eyes set either side of this shark's anvil-shaped head offer a near 360-degree view. It swings its head from side to side like a metal detector, allowing its electroreceptors to constantly scan its surroundings. Hammerheads roam the entire Pacific Ocean, but they're drawn to the waters around Malpelo Island by the thermoclines, the layers of water where hot and cold currents collide. The cold upwellings around the island bring the sharks particularly close to the surface. Meters below, many hammerheads begin to come together in organized, evenly spaced hierarchies. And they do so in astonishing numbers. The waters from Malpelo, east to Cocos Islands and south to Galapagos are known as the Hammerhead Triangle. It's one of the world's extraordinary natural sites. Schools of hundreds, sometimes thousands of hammerhead sharks gather and slowly circle the island. At Malpelo, they are predominantly scalloped hammerheads named for the markings on the ridge between the eyes. The schools are almost entirely female. They outnumber the male sharks by six to one. The largest, most aggressive females are in the center. The reason, it's thought, is to make them easy for males to locate. 
A large shark is a strong one. And the biggest females, reaching over four meters in length, are the most highly sought for mating. Apart from the odd food grab at the surface, these huge aggregations are mostly social. The hammerheads are only here by day. Their night hunting grounds are in deeper waters nearby. Their birthing grounds are even further afield, close to the coastline, some 500 kilometers away. It will take many years for the juveniles to grow large enough to travel the distance and avoid being eaten themselves before they too can join the astounding aggregations around this remote, rocky outcrop. Malpelo defies all tropes of the typical Pacific island, but is a testament to the astonishing variety of terrain in this enormous sea. The variability of plants and animals existing in one area, known as marine biodiversity, appears to thin out across the Pacific from west to east. It spurred recent scientific theory that the Coral Triangle, the western region with the densest marine biodiversity on Earth, may have seeded the greater Pacific. Oceanic currents carry tiny larvae and great migrators alike across staggering distances. Settlers in new corners survive, adapt, and evolve in astonishing ways. And with the Pacific Ocean's depths less mapped than the surface of Mars, we are yet to uncover so many more of these life forms that we share this planet with. <laughs>